Hi everyone, I'm Sash. Uh, I'm the lead engineer at Pungle. Pungle is a fintech startup, and we provide real-time payment processing to our customers. Uh, I've been at Pungle for about a year and a half, uh, and I lead a team, small team, about six engineers, uh, but they're really talented. Uh, so today I'm going to briefly talk about Pungle, you may not have heard of us, uh, and what we do, which is real-time payment processing. Uh, I'll get into a little bit of our architecture and how we're able to do payment processing in real time, uh, touching on some of the applications involved. Uh, and then in order, in our platform, we use a ton of services from AWS, but there's three in particular that are really important when we talk about transaction processing. Uh, so I want to highlight those and how they've allowed us to overcome some of the challenges. First one would be AWS Simple Queue Service, uh, the actual on AWS Key Management Service, and third, AWS EC2 Auto Scale. So Pungle was founded here in Toronto in April 2017. Uh, since then, our engineering team has grown from two to about six. Uh, the Pungle platform itself uh, acts as a hub and connects to various payment networks, Visa, EFT, ACH, in order to provide flexibility to our customers to pay the way they want. Uh, but the Pungle, Pungle platform was born out of the idea of bringing real-time payments to Canada. In the past couple years, modern payment networks like Visa and MasterCard have allowed third parties and innovative companies like Bungle uh, in order um, access to their networks to process transactions. So that's where the real time comes in. So with real time payments, uh, we get real time business payments. So the business payment landscape in Canada hasn't changed much in the past decade or so. Uh, they still write checks, they still send DFTs. Uh, but checks are slow, expensive, prone to fraud. Uh, EFTs are also fairly slow. Uh, so when a business uses Pungle, they're able to process payments through these more modern networks, Visa or MasterCard, uh, and the payments settle in, in a matter of minutes and seconds. So they're able to make these payments in real time, which is very important. So some examples of this are uh, for companies whose core business revolves around real time. So if you're a lender who's automated the underwriting process, you're now able to disperse funds just as quickly. Uh, or for the new, pay, uh, the new gig economy or real-time payroll, uh, anyone, everyone works in Canada, so you're familiar with the two-week pay cycle, right? But work has changed, and people want to get paid now at the end of their shift or at the end of the day. Uh, an example of this is drivers of ride-sharing applications. They want to get paid per ride or once they're done driving for the day. And real-time payments makes this possible. So how do we do this? Well, we started building the Pungle platform about a year ago. Uh, so we had the advantage to choose some modern technologies and tool sets. And we also took a cloud-first approach. So we really looked for what, out, what was out there and what could we utilize without trying to reinvent the wheel. So we also knew that when processing transactions, concurrency would be one of the first challenges we'd face. Uh, so has anyone heard of a language called Elixir? Yeah, okay, one hand. That's better than, better than I thought. Uh, so Elixir is a language built around concurrency. Uh, it's built, the functional language, and it sits atop the Erlang VM, which was built with concurrency and fault tolerance in mind. Uh, so our core platform consists of several applications, mostly written in Elixir, that communicate through a central messaging system. Uh, when processing transactions, we do see payment card data, so we must be a PCI compliant environment. Uh, for anyone who's worked in that kind of scenario, uh, you know how challenging it can be. Uh, for anyone who hasn't, consider yourselves pretty lucky. So we expose both a public API and a web front end, and we leverage a ton of AWS services to make this possible with just a small team. So here's kind of a high level diagram of the Pungle platform. Uh, we have our web front end, which is a series of static files served through S3 and CloudFront. Uh, we also accept uh, through our API uh, requests. So all transaction requests come into our first application, which is Teller. Uh, Teller is part of its own EC2 auto scale group. Teller then communicates with some other AWS services such as SES, such as ElastiCache and RDS. Uh, once Teller has received this transaction request, it's able to run through some simple business rules and validations and then place the message onto our messaging queues. Uh, so our messaging queues are SQS FIFO queues. 
Next, the core application, the one involved in the actual payment processing, is able to retrieve these messages. Uh, it's then able to add the appropriate payment card data. Um, it decrypts this data using AWS KMS and is able to forward the message on to the appropriate payment network. Uh, once that's done, once that's complete, Core is able to put the message back onto the messaging system for further reconciliation downstream. So that's kind of the flow in a high level. So as you can see, we use a ton of services from AWS to make this possible. Uh, and that's really just from the application developer's perspective. We also use a lot of the networking stuff um, as well. But there are three really important services in transaction processing that I want to highlight uh, and really talk about and show the challenges that they've helped us solve. So the first one being AWS Key Management Service, the next AWS Simple Queue Service, and the third AWS EC2 Auto Scale. Uh, so the next couple of slides, I'm going to show three distinct challenges we faced when building this transaction processing system and how each of these services allowed us to overcome it. So the first one is encryption key management. So as I said, Pongo is a PCI DSS compliant environment. So we store credit card data, and along with that comes some very strong rules. Uh, we need to ensure that wherever we store the card number, it is unreadable. We need, to main, we need to store our key encryption key in a separate location from our data encryption key. We also need to rotate these keys once they've hit their end of life. Uh, we also need to provide detailed audit trail for access to all of these keys. And then lastly, we need to implement dual control. So dual control means that no single entity can have access to both the encryption keys or the decryption process itself. Right. So there do exist various hardware and software solutions that will provide this for you. Um, but for a young startup, they're expensive. Uh, and the hardware solutions can be difficult to scale. So we wanted to take, again, a cloud-first approach. Uh, so we chose AWS KMS. So right away, AWS KMS is a PCI DSS level one certified environment. Uh, so they automatically satisfy our requirement to hold the key encryption keys. They also provide us key rotation right away, right out of the box, with a click. They provide audit capabilities for access to these keys through CloudWatch and CloudTrail. And by separating where the encryption keys are held, uh, by creating separate AWS accounts, one to hold uh, the encryption keys and one to hold the application that actually is involved with decryption, we're able to satisfy the dual control requirement. So AWS KMS really right away solved a lot of the problems and requirements that we had and minimized the amount of custom code we had to write in order to build this key management solution. So the second challenge we face, uh, as you can see, is there's a lot of communication, a lot of applications and third parties involved in processing a transaction. So we need to main sure, maintain a robust communication method between all these applications. So for that, we introduce a central messaging system. Uh, by using a central messaging system, it allows us to handle scenarios where a third party payment processor may be unavailable. right? Our application is still able to accept transactions, place them on the queue, and wait and for availability of that payment network again. Another scenario occurs where we receive large amount, a large volume of transactions, and we don't want to just simply pass through and flood our partner payment networks. So by using the queues, we can provide back pressure, and with the core application, uh, provide still that constant flow of transactions. So we do process transaction messages in this queuing system. So we need to ensure that messages are able to be encrypted on the fly and that nothing's lost, right? That's unacceptable in the world of payments. We can't lose your transaction. So that was very important for us. Uh, if you were here earlier, Wattpad gave a fantastic talk and in-depth look at messaging semantics, uh, very important. So we had some requirements when looking for these queuing systems. Uh, one is that it works well with Erlang and Elixir, our development languages. Uh, two is that it's easy, it's easy to scale. For a small team, we don't want to handle the infrastructure uh, due to varying transaction volumes. We want it to just be automatic. Um, and the third is it's fast, right? We're processing transactions in real time. We want this thing to happen in about three seconds, right? We can't wait for the queues 
uh, in that case. So we did explore some of the common messaging technologies out there, Kafka, Redis, RouteMQ. You guys probably use some combination of those. Um, but we found that Elixir being new, there wasn't proper support for it, or they were too complex for the size of our team. Uh, we didn't want to be overwhelmed in complexity, and, uh, considering how important a, a component this was in our application. Uh, so we chose SQS. <laughs> And it was basically a drop in, drop in implementation for us. Uh, message encryption at the click of a button, right? Uh, using the FIFO queues, we get strict ordering, which is important when it comes to transactions. We want to ensure that we pull money from one location before pushing it to another. Uh, we also get simple message deduplication, uh, kind of out of the box. Um, again, we do need to enforce some checks at the application layer, but it, it's nice to know that that is there. Uh, and yeah, and it scales automatically as well, right? So we don't have to worry about increased transaction volumes overwhelming our queues. Uh, so SQS really, really helped us with this problem and, and made it a simple decision. So the last one is that at its core, Pungal is a transaction processing engine. And transaction volumes vary. They're not constant. We do hit spikes um, and we do see low times. As I said, our main development language is Elixir. Uh, so we, do, we are able to squeeze a lot of performance, a lot of raw compute power out of any given machine. Um, so Elixir itself uh, runs, in, it, the code of Elixir runs in lightweight processes, and each of these is able to be garbage collected individually. Um, so it means that we don't have the stop the world garbage collection processes of other languages. Uh, so it gives us the ability to really squeeze every ounce of performance out of a machine. All right. So why don't we just go buy the biggest machine at the store, call it a day, and we don't have to worry, right? But that's, uh, that doesn't fit, right? It's too expensive. We're a small startup. We want to optimize on cost. We want to be able to scale with the transaction volumes appropriately. And on top of that, we don't just want to scale our whole system in one way, right? We have multiple applications with different usage patterns, teller, core, right? So we wanted to apply different scaling rules to different parts of our platform. So in came ECS Autoscale. So here, using ECS Autoscale, or EC2 Autoscale, sorry, we're able to define separate scaling groups for our application, so one for Teller and one for Core. Uh, this allows us to handle us scenarios where we receive a large influx of transactions. Uh, we can scale up Teller appropriately based on simple metrics like CPU, CPU utilization on the machines, uh, and accept those transactions and place them on the queues. We can then scale core differently and maintain a constant flow, right? So we only want to, to pass on a constant rate of messages to not flood our payment networks. So we can ensure that core always has a consistent number of machines. If one fails, the auto scale group will reboot and, uh, and give us a new machine, uh, while Teller can scale up and down completely independently. And the best part of this is once we set it up, we don't have to worry, right? It does this automatically for us. We're not guessing about scheduling, oh, we think there's going to be a large volume of transactions due to this, because it's very hard and we don't know. So here's just a quick review of how we use, of some of the services we use. So when we receive a transaction request, that request is first processed by our application teller. Uh, teller then takes that transaction request and places it on our queuing system, which we use using AWS SQS. That message is then read through our core system, which contacts KMS uh, in, order to to, uh, in order to perform the encryption and decryption process for our payment card data and forward that message on to the payment networks. So just kind of to wrap up, the main services have really helped us, SQS, KMS, and Autoscale. Um, they really allowed a small team to build a robust and reliable payment processing engine something we couldn't have done if we went for an on-premises approach and tried to reinvent the wheel, right? We want to process transactions. We don't need to, um, to build some of these services for us. So thank you. That's it. Amazing. Thank you, Sash, very much. Um, questions for Sash?
Hi. Uh, how are you handling failed or partial process payments? Uh, partial process payments? Uh, so are you like partialing in what way? Meaning that between the connection to the payment yeah. network? Yeah, money is gone from the account. But, uh, it's not go it's not credited to the originator, right? You're making it. Uh, yeah, so uh, partial process payments are, of course, a difficult, connect, uh, difficult problem to handle. So the connection between Core and the payment network is very payment network independent. Uh, each payment network, a partial payment to a different payment network means a different thing. Um, so some payment networks, so if we're unable to fully validate that a, a, a payment was processed on that network, there is an internal queuing system within Core to not provide an answer back to the rest of the system until it's satisfied with the response from the payment network. So things like timeouts may happen. So, yep. Sorry? How much is your TTL in the SQS queue? Oh, TTL. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the time to live on the message is about, uh, so in general, um, we, spend a lot of time. We use dead letter queues instead, so we try, so we have a long TTL on the queue itself, uh, but we would have a couple days. Um, and the way we handle that is we try and retry messages with a payment network. If that fails, they're able to be placed on the dead letter queues, which we take great advantage of. It allows us to look at that message and understand why it failed. Was it we constructed the message incorrectly or that, mess that payment network is unavailable? We can then place that message uh, per scenario back on the queues uh, and continue the process. Yeah. Hey, hi, question. Uh, uh, you mentioned you use EC2 instances yep. and what was the rationale to go with EC2 instead of containers, for example? Sorry? Uh, what was the rationale to go with EC2 instead of containers? Yeah, that's uh, a good know. question. Yeah, so we just chose raw EC2 instances uh, based on a couple factors. Um, number one, our development language being Elixir, uh, the container size would get quite large. Um, we had to package a lot of things in there. Number two, um, we were, we didn't want to try too many new services out at once. Um, we knew the performance of Elixir. Um, some of our developers have worked in the past on raw machines. And the Erlang runtime itself, which Elixir is part of, um, actually provides a ton of information and, and wants to function in a stateful way. It wants to have control and access to the entire machine. It doesn't want to be constrained to a container. And a lot of the um, native functionality of Erlang uh, depends on it actually having access to the entire machine, not being segmented in some kind of container. So that's why we haven't jumped onto the container bandwagon at this point. Um, we've not, we haven't said no. But the Erlang, the Erlang system does like to be stateful, uh, whereas containers are really not. You want to tear one down um, and place a new one, while Erlang wants to run forever. Uh, so it's really just a difference of opinion with uh, the runtime environment we have and the language we chose and containers themselves. All right, Stosh, thank you very much again. Thank you, Tongo.